Welcome. I'm Julie Bacon, and you're listening to the Mindset Coaching for Handlers podcast, a podcast for dog handlers who are on a mission to achieve big goals. Here I share lessons, insights, personal stories, and tools you can apply during your next show, trial, or test to help you strengthen your mental game and hopefully cue more consistently. Be sure to check out the show notes where you'll find details about the episodes, plus important links, including the link to the Dogged Planner and Workbook created just for handlers on a mission. So if you're ready to improve your competitive mindset, get out of your own way, and connect with your dog like never before, then it's time to get comfy, bring an open mind, and work your mindset. Hey there, welcome back. All right, just a brief introduction to this week's episode because I have a guest. Kara Armour will introduce herself, but she is also a podcast host. And we met, became fast friends, and well, you'll hear, the rest is history. So enjoy this special episode of the podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. This week, I am super excited to have Carrie Armour, who is my guest today. And we're going to talk a long time. So I hope your drive is long today to the trial because uh, the two of us don't do anything short. I've already learned. Um, We've got so much to say on this topic. I got to Kara because of her podcast, Stress for Success. And I listened and I was immediately like, oh my God, this is great. And there's just so many connections between handler stress and dog stress. And so we got together. We're already fast besties. It's done. And we just knew that we had to talk about it together. So this is actually the second episode, but don't stress. If you didn't listen to the first one, you don't have to listen to them in order. It's not one of those things because today we're going to talk about the fact that how what the dog is doing, how that affects our stress. And we already kind of know that, um, but you know, I don't really get into behavioral stuff. I focus on the handler, but we know that we're always like that whole dog goes, their stress goes down the leash thing. So that's what we're going to get into today because it's really two sides, same coin. I don't know. There's going to be a lot of metaphors, I suspect. So without further ado, I'm going to have Kara introduce herself and talk a little bit about how she got into this lane of with her podcast and just dog training in general. Well, thank you, Julie, so much for having me. And I am going to say that not only does stress go down the leash, but it comes right back up whether it's connected (laughs) or not, because that's what I've learned on my journey. (laughs) Um, I will try and be brief. I'm Kara Armour. My podcast is Startline, but that is kind of my newest venture. I'm a certified dog trainer through Karen Pryor Academy. And what's special about that is I got trained by Emma Parsons, the Emma Parsons. If you don't know who she is, look her up. She wrote the book, Click to Calm. I had such an opportunity that I pounced upon. And through that, through my dog training, and I've had a a dog walking company with my husband, I call myself an accidental agility nerd. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm a behavior nerd that has really dove deep down into agility with a heavy concentration there. And it, it all just kind of started really quickly. I've been in dogs for over 20 years. I was given money when I graduated college by my grandmother and she was very, she had a lot of forethought. She was fiduciarily responsible and she wanted Mm -hmm. me to start up an IRA and I was 21 and I took that money (laughs) and I bought myself. I already love this. (laughs) I bought myself a puppy and that honestly, I finally do have an IRA. Don't worry. That was my best investment ever because that started me on my journey of life. I met the best people in my life. I met my husband at a dog park, which you'll never catch me dead in now, but (laughs) so much good happened from that seemingly irresponsible decision. And I just have to say there are no regrets there. (laughs) (laughs) I love Um, that. Yeah. Unfortunately, that puppy, because I was not a good purchaser, I was not educated and they were backyard bred and it was a boxer. It had a lot of health problems. And that started my other journey of finding and fixing this breed I love so much. And so then I I had a four-year kind of search for the perfect confirmation dog, because in order to breed good dogs, you have to, you know, to me, confirmation was you had to prove to the public that this dog upstanding, you know, upheld the breed or upheld the breed standard. Mm-hmm. So after finding that dog, um, I literally just had a friend over and she was like, hey, your dogs are really bouncy. You should do agility. I was like, what's the deal? <laughs> and there it was. It just snowballed oh. from there. I got extremely lucky, which is also a blessing and curse, 
that my novice A dog was just brilliant. She picked up things faster than I did. She was smarter than I am. And I say that confidently. She just got it. And so it made me look really good and it made me feel really good. (laughs) We did have struggles. We did end up getting into some ring stress. I overcame that. And then I thought the best thing to do would be to breed her, right? Why not make more of her? And I assumed I would have the, you know, little versions of her. And I didn't. (laughs) I have, I love them to bits and pieces, but her breedings have produced very different dogs, all wonderful. But you want to talk about stress up. You want to talk about stress down. You want to talk about the bubble of stress moving that it, they put me on my journey and I'm, I'm grateful to have them, but I will say um, it's been a journey. And I always tell people, when you run a boxer in agility, it's like taming a clown. Sometimes clowns get really <laughs> sad and sometimes clowns get really happy. And um, only people that really have run a boxer truly understand. Roger O'Sullivan, one of the great judges out there, yep. he ran a boxer for a while. And I was in Maine once and my dogs were just being absurd. And he and I he saw I was sad and upset and he pulled me aside and he said, you can do nothing but laugh. You have to laugh. And that, you know, was a part wow, of my journey. That's really good advice. I mean, it really in the is. moment, it might not have been, but looking it back, I was like, oh my God, that's freaking brilliant. That's like life advice. <laughs> it is life advice. And so, and I, you know, I always share that with my students too, but so it, I became this trainer. I then um, am very fortunate to have a facility very close to me, Gemini Dogs. I teach agility, CGC, tricks, impulse control, you name it, I teach it. And I also have a private training company that's with my husband and a dog walking company. And I also am the program director for Pro Pet Hero, which is a pet first aid and CPR instruction company um, or program that's through pro trainings. Basically, I want to make dogs lives better by teaching people. That's it. I love this. Yeah. So you're not busy at all. Got it. No. <laughs> and, um, with that. So I'm also you know, stubborn, I guess you could say, which I don't like to use in the dog world because in order to be stubborn, you must have mastered the behavior and chose to defy it. Most of our dogs do not understand the behavior and therefore are not choosing to defy it. They're just cautionary and not doing it. Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. understood and was told many times that you will not succeed with boxers. They're not an agility breed. And I decided to prove a lot of people wrong. I love that. I, yeah. uh, yeah, people don't expect my breed to be any good either. So I, I can relate to that. So I was like, oh, agility grand champion. No boxer has it. Sure. Premier titles. Nobody has it. Sure. I'll go do it. 22 agility championships between three dogs. Sure. No problem. I'll go do it. Uh, Make finals at invitationals twice and play second in a 20 inch dog amongst 121 other 20 inch dogs. And mind you, I went in the preferred dog. I went in. Yeah. So yeah. Um, That's that's me in a nutshell. You put a challenge in front of me and uh, bring it. Well, of course. And I love all that because that brings up great mindset questions, right? So um, that could be a a fantastic tangent for us, but I'm going to try to behave with my (laughs) love of tangents and um, just give a, a, I'm going to give a little context to this because um, for your podcast start line episodes, episode 35 was my introduction to you. Mm -hmm. And then of course that was the second in a two part and episode 33 was the first, and it was called stress for success. You did it with your a friend and a really great behavioral person and secretary and someone with a big hat rack as well. Yes, uh, huge hat rack. A, a huge hat rack. And um, and that podcast just really, I mean, it really touched a nerve. I mean, that's the best kind of phrase I have for it. It really seemed to touch a nerve. And those two past pa- podcasts really seem to help a lot of people understand stress and understand it. Well, understand it a little better, right? Because mm-hmm. I think you could listen to those two podcasts, you know, this month, six months from now, six months from then, and take away something different every time because the journey changes and your perspective of the journey changes along with it. Um, But I think that was why a lot of like, well, for sure, it's why we got together because the stress and the back and forth, the, you know, the back and forthness of the stress is so amazing and you really can't untangle it truly. I mean, I talk to my clients a lot about how our dogs can trigger us, right? They do something Mm -hmm. 
they that reminds you of that time that they did something a year ago and oh my god it took you a year to fix and oh no oh no oh no and then panic ensues and your dog's like I just jumped off the table like what is the big deal <laughs> right so it causes all this like disconnect and triggering and emotions back and forth and like you said that that stress is running up and down the leash right we have to take responsibility for the part that runs down but we can't ignore the part that is running up because otherwise it's half of the picture. And so I just think that that's, I don't know, we're going to go in a lot of places, but I think that's like a great jumping off point um, for us. And maybe we even want to start and we can start wherever you want, but we maybe even start on the start line because I love the word you used. Which it's a, like a compression, I think was your word. It's like everything so in that much. moment happens. And then my thought is we start there. We think about all the places it goes out, you know, cause you really trace the roots back to like what happened at dinner last night, you know, for right. like what is potentially happening in your start line. So let's start with the name of the podcast. Let's start with the start line. Let's start with that thought about compression and what you mean by that. And then let's see where we go. Well, as I say in, you know, my introduction to the podcast is it does all start at the start line and we do all end up on a start line, whether it's in training, if you never trial, you always have to start somewhere. And to me, first off, I'm wildly impressed by our dog's ability to function in the situations that we put them in because we train very hard. But then when we get to a trial, regardless of the atmosphere and you being different, we now set them up in this compression zone where you have, you know, not to be gross, but dog butt after dog butt after dog butt sitting. <laughs> and they get a lot of their information from dog butts, right? right. And so the, and the first that, thing we say is don't sniff. <laughs> right. And we're telling them, don't gather any information and solely pay attention to me. But PS run parallel to me and take these obstacles that I've trained you on in a completely different environment, under different circumstances with different barometric pressure and pheromones. And I smell weird. And I, I kudos to it's our amazing. Dogs. Yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. And I think what fascinates me is being such a determined person and feeling comfortable with my mindset, but learning tons from you. I actually figured out that my struggles were dealing with stress with my dogs and I could be a successful and I could be a great trainer, but if I didn't learn what my dogs were telling me, mm. particularly mm -hmm. on the start line, I made a lot of yeah. mistakes on the start line. <laughs> we talk about how I, I bend over and kiss. I grab their fruities. I call it their fruities, their <laughs> cheek material, and I would kiss my dogs. And I have video after video of Debbie lip licking, turning her head, doing all kinds of calming signals, which we'll get into saying, I don't like this. Please stop. It's yucky. And right. yet I did it for years. And I still do it with her Isn't because amazing? now, right, she is conditioned. This dog is phenomenal. She is conditioned to understand that that is our go button. And she, right. I can't say she likes it now, but she accepts that just like getting, her well, she's built, I call it a building an association, right? She's right. finally, after all these years of torture, this torturous <laughs> behavior, she finally built a positive association to it because she's like, okay, if I go through this quick torture, it means I get to run. Yes. And I think what happened with, you know, so much starts on the start line. Some of it can show up at the weave poles. It can show up at different areas, but your dog is giving you a crap ton of information at that start line. And what you choose to do from that point on can set your run. And that's yeah. why I think to me, start line is so poignant and important and fundamental to really understanding. And, and we talked a bit about rituals, but that's why the, the crate to gate and then the gate to setup and even the setup to departure, there are pieces just going through that gate, do you take the leash off the second you go through the gate? Do you set your dog up, then bend over and take the leash off? Do you stand beside them? Do you have a leash that slides over their head and causes little hairs to get caught and is really icky? There's so many finite yeah. details to just the start line that we don't pay attention yeah. to. And there's two things in that. Well, there's going to be a million, but there's two things right now is that one, I think we misinterpret a lot of things. You know, I, I think we like, I know again, novice a dog or even my, my poor Marxie as my listeners know, well, um, you know, we think that they're being bad or we think uh -huh. they're doing like, to your point, they're being stubborn or they're choosing 
to do something we don't want. They know this. They know they know what I want. They know what I want. Well, it's a different context, whatever. We can get into that. But like the point is, is we're misinterpreting a lot of their behaviors. Mm-hmm. And then because we're misinterpreting, we're telling ourselves a story. This is a, I, I do this a lot in, with my clients. We're telling ourselves a story about what it means when our dog turns away from us, for instance, if we're trying to give him a kiss or, you know, does some of that. And we, we make up this tale, this elaborate tale about what this means. And then therefore, oh my God, this is going to happen. And oh no, and oh my, and, and all of that. And I think the interpretation of this takes time. And one thing I'm always, I'm always telling people is like, what if you were just curious? What if you were just curious about like, oh, when they do that, I wonder, or if when this happens, I wonder. <laughs> and what if it was a more of a what if game than it was a, oh no, game, <laughs> you know, because I think there's a lot of the oh no's that are happening when maybe you should respond or maybe you don't need to respond. Like, I don't know. There's, I think what makes me sad is that yes, there we do need to understand dogs better to understand the situations that we're putting them in to understand when they are asking for help. I can guarantee you that 90% of the time, if not more, they are not being jerks. I There are dogs that are jerks, no doubt. Sure. They go out there and like, ha, 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 no, nope, I'm not going to do right. this today. But most of the time in a pressure setting, a pressure bubble, the starting from the start line and fanning out into the course, they're asking for help when they slow down. They're asking for help when they refuse to do a jump. They're asking for help when they come out of the weep poles or can't get in there. They're asking for help when they run by the A-frame that you know is their favorite obstacle. There's so much to unpack there, but we as humans, and I know we hear this a ton, but our dogs do not generalize well. We have to understand that their brain for processing is a thousand times different than ours. They can process faster than us. So much. So much faster than us, but we can interpret and, and change things and create stories like they never would. And so we know I'm sitting in my office, you're sitting in your office and Wendy, sorry, was barking, was next to me in my (laughs) office. She doesn't know she's in my office, right? I couldn't take her to your house and go into your office and she'd be like, oh, I'm in Julie's office. Oh, office, got it. I'm in this whole new building with new smells. It's completely different, right? And even if you train at the same facility and you set up the same place every single time, that start line on Tuesday night is very different than the start line on Saturday morning. The smells, yeah. the compression zone where all of those smells and pheromones and everything are boiling down. So my takeaway is I don't expect everybody to go out and be a dog trainer, but if you do one thing differently, start to ask yourself questions. Does, does this help my dog improve their performance? And what I mean by that is, for example, One of the hardest things I'm struggling with and maybe getting on several soapboxes about is the AKC (laughs) in novice and open allow you to have errors. You can have a refusal. You can have a wrong course. You can have a table fault. You can have a bunch of errors and still qualify. So what that means is if you don't, if you're not clear, and I see this with my students, if you're not clear in queuing a jump because you're worried about your position, because that's what makes agility hard. You have to have a connection with your dog and worry about your positioning. For a brain that does not process as fast as a dog, this is difficult. And so that's one of the challenges that we love. But if we don't cue a jump and our dog misses it, and novice, you can bring them back and still qualify. You can do that twice, right? You could then, you know, have a table fall and still qualify. Then when we get to masters, that's sort of embedded. Oh, our dog missed it. We have to show them what's right. What we're now doing is not necessarily showing the dog what's right. We just told them what was wrong, that they were wrong because we made them repeat. Right. And repeating can break a dog's spirit. And so I I watch that time and time again. And this is where it's been really important to me with my journey with Wendy. I believe, and Wendy is my almost two, she'll be two in June, boxer that is working line. I got this hard, tough boxer because I wanted to avoid mm-hmm. all the stress my other ones had. And then she started to display stress. And I said, oh, it's me. Hey. I'm the common <laughs> denominator. Right. And then I realized, Yeah, part of it is me, but some of it is also dog and the expectations I set on this dog. And she blew through novice, not because we didn't have any faults. We definitely have faults, but I fixed them, right? I got those cues. They weren't all clean. Some of them were, some of them were not. 
And then we got to master's and she was so, we had had this reinforcement history of if I don't get it right, she's going to make me do it again, which means I'm wrong, which I'm going to slow down and make sure I really get this right. Now I never let her know in a trial that she's wrong. I never. And I can't tell well, you how and powerful you say that. It, and I can hear, I can hear the responses. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I can hear the reactions to that mm -hmm. because some of that is so counter, right? Because, oh my God, you're teaching the dog to blow by the weaves or you're yeah. teaching the dog to do this. And it's funny because, and by the way, you know, there's a thousand answers out there. I'm not going to try to convince every person, but you could make that same argument in novice that you're teaching them that they have a second chance mm -hmm. or you're teaching them that if they can't get jump weaves, because their momentum, you know, carrying into the weaves makes collecting for the weaves too hard, that it's okay. They get another chance. They get another chance. So the, the biggest takeaway is we're always teaching them. We're always, we're teaching them like right now, my dogs are lying down, quiet, whatever, but I'm teaching them because I'm interacting them. They're chilling. I'm doing this. They know I'm busy, whatever, whatever. We're always teaching them how to react to us, how mm -hmm. to be in our lives. And so I think one of the amazing things is that you're really helping with is building awareness of what you're seeing. Like, what is it you're seeing? What was the environment? What happened before that? What happened before that? What happened before that? So when you talk about like the start line and of course the dominoes that go out in every direction and what we're teaching them, like how do you teach your students to like awareness basically, or like, is that, or is that even where you start? And that's not where you start. Like, how do you teach it, I wouldn't us say all to be better handlers? So I think it's small pieces. Don't feel overwhelmed by what I'm going to say, because this took me years and it actually took, it took someone else pointing it out many times for me to even see it. So I have to have patience with people too, because I watch them on their own journey and I've spent hours with them trying to help them. And I feel like they don't hear me and I get all offended. And, <laughs> and then I realize they can't hear me like I couldn't hear myself. Sometimes we need to see it and experience it ourselves. But I will say since the podcast, because we have reached a broader audience, I am seeing people try different things. And it works. Some, some yeah. don't. Like some, it's like it is a little bit spaghetti against the wall. But here's the deal. Correct. Some dogs take your fix and go and fix that line because you messed up. Your dog might've just been going so fast. It didn't collect itself. And you want to go a couple obstacles back and show it how to collect. Great. That is not, I'm not saying to take that off the table, but for some teams and many teams that have dogs, particularly that slow down, can't come off the start line or come off the start line too fast, or you feel like you don't have that connection. It, they're sensitive. And most people know what a sensitive dog is. What is fixing in that moment going to get you? And here's a great well, and discussion. Even, sorry, I totally have to jump in because the other thing, because I got excited. Um, the other thing I heard in that is even in your description of those two scenarios, the energy was a thousand times different. Mm -hmm. The energy of the person who just wants to use it as a learning opportunity, use the fix and go, take the dog back three obstacles or two obstacles, whatever, and do the mm -hmm. line and show the dog. That's one kind of energy. The energy of the person who's like, God damn it, Rover, I know you know how to get in these weaves. And we're going to stand, I'm going to stand here at the beginning of these weave poles until you get in them. That is night and day energy. Mm -hmm. And I know my dogs would react to that very differently. And so I think some of it also comes back to, and of course, this is where to me, you and I are like perfect, like push and pull, right? Because that to me is like, okay, as the handler, what is your responsibility in that moment? What do you want to do? What do you think is best for the dog? What's your plan? And what's your process goal going into the ring? If you know your dog has trouble collecting into the weaves, for instance, what is your plan that is the best plan so that three months from now, your dog is, is, is in a better, has made progress? right? Whatever progress looks like for you. Yes. So, so sorry, I had oh, to jump in because I was like, oh my God, because it just feels like that, that just, th that's those two examples sounded 
completely different coming out of your mouth. And, and they are. And that's what I was trying to, to express. And I didn't want to use breeds because you can have a lab oh, or yeah, it even a boxer matter. that had a moment yeah. where it's like, Duh! and it got too excited and right. we have to bring them back and rein them in and show them the line so that they, they get reined in and they feel, okay, all right, we're back on track. Oh, I got right? this. They're tasking. Yeah. There's a difference between when a dog is in task and a dog is communicating they need help. So a couple of things I want to unpack there. And I'm going to use a student as an example. This weekend, so they have an A-frame issue in class. The criteria has not been clear to the dog, and we are making that clear. We are on that journey, and they are aware of that. So in a trial, the dog would miss the contact, and my student asked me, should I bring him back and do it again? I said, absolutely not. No, because the dog doesn't understand the criteria, right? right. In a standard run, if your dog misses the contact, and you go, uh-oh, and you go to bring it back, and the dog gets it, Unless you have a way to celebrate and reward, right. don't do it. However, in a court in a class like Time to Beat, go ahead and bring his favorite tuggy toy in and do the A-frame three times. Sure. And every time he gets it, reward that. The difference is the dog in the trial that missed the contact that doesn't have a reliable contact behavior to begin with does not know that they're wrong. So why would you tell them that they're wrong? Instead, why not focus on when they're right? Because when we reward a dog for being correct, the likelihood of the behavior repeating and being reliable increases. Right. Telling a dog that they're wrong at the wrong time or not being exactly clear, can you really tell that dog that they didn't put the dog in the yellow, I mean, the foot in the yellow in a trial setting? And you're, you're going to tell me that your correction is so spot on, the dog knows that they missed that foot, even though they hit the A-frame, miss the contact and bounced into the table. And now you're going to quote unquote, correct them. Right. You're going to be so confused. Well, and also the dog who doesn't know the criteria doesn't know what wrong or right is. Correct. And that's I what- I mean, so then you put them back on and you expect them to be right. It's like rolling the dice. Right. And you have an equal, oper well, you probably have an equal chance of them being wrong again and wrong again. <laughs> yep. okay. And then you get As you into- do them being right. And if they're right, are you going to promise you're going to leave the ring and have steak party? Right. Or... How many people go on from right. there? And so right. the dog was not, the dog was not marked in the correct scenario. So anyways, the, the flip side is when people say, well, if I let the behavior get away and I get this, especially from, you call it the hangover from obedience. I get yeah. this from longtime obedience people. If you allow the dog to do the incorrect behavior, say run by the weave poles or get in and come out or miss the contact and you go on, aren't you just training the dog that in a trial situation, they don't need to complete that obstacle? And let me tell you, nope. Nope. Yeah, I've because really learned this one the hard way. When I, your with dog Mo with Moxie, yeah. When your dog cannot perform the obstacle that you know they know, we know our dogs know how to weave. In that situation, they cannot. They're telling you, I can't. And Noreen has really great um, analogies for this, right? I could sing to you right now, and I know probably several hundred people will be listening and be a little embarrassing, but it's just you and me, <laughs> and I could probably sing, and I'm a terrible singer. But if you put me in Carnegie Hall and told me to sing, oh, no. Oh, no. I couldn't yeah. do it. And that's what's happening to our dogs. In training, in trialing, in training, they can, they can do the weaves. Right? right. We get to a trial in that moment, that line, that feeling they can't. You're not teaching them that they don't have to. You're letting them not bake in deeper stress. And I can't right. tell you. So so I, this weekend, I'm sorry. It's OK. Wendy's it's a dog have, podcast. I know. She's going to have a conversation <laughs> with Jasper or my, my neighbor's dog. So this weekend, <laughs> Wendy had or last weekend, sorry, Wendy had a dog judge issue. There was a judge okay. in the ring and he counted it a little bit differently and it caught her attention. She was a little weirded out by it. So we proceeded on. She just looked at him at the table. She was slow to come off the table. So I knew I was like, mm, here we go. Mm. She actually got all the way around the course. Second to last obstacle was the weaves. And this dog has fabulous weaves. Pulls out with pole 10 because the judge is now coming up behind us and following us. She gives him a hard stare, pops out. I clap, yay, and go on. You know, I said something like, oh, not today. Like she has no right. idea that I said, we're not going to cue or whatever. And then, so the old Kara, the obedience trained Kara <laughs> yep. would say, crap, she's not going to get the weaves in the next run because I just told her she doesn't have to do them. I just taught my dog. She does not need to do the weaves in a trial environment. Nope. I just put money in the good bank account because we got into jumpers and she queued because there yeah. was, it was a different judge. It was not a scary environment. 
And so that's what we have to understand when our dog avoids the table and we scream, table, 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 table. We're not helping the dog do the table in that environment. We're making it worse. We're making it really miserable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I have learned that the hard way. Um, And I'm going to admit that like the first time someone said that to me, like, don't worry about him, run by him, let her pop out, whatever. I, it broke my brain. It really did because it was so counter to everything I had learned up until then. And um, like, you know, I can already hear the listeners being like, oh, my trainer says this, or I think that, or that's crazy, or you guys are dumb or whatever. And that's great. Like everybody has their own training perspectives. That's fine. I agree with this approach, right? For my dogs, it's I've really seen a huge difference. I wish I could go back in time and, you know, fix the things I didn't know, you know, four years ago. Like, would it have been different? I'm sure it would have. Um, and the other thing for me is when you're talking, of course, I'm listening for like the handler side of this, right? Because I get how frustrating it is, right? To have a problem that continues, you know, or to have something that comes up or to be able to think in the moment and let it go. Or, you know, I mean, that is where the mindset piece comes in, but where we have to be meeting our dog in this like compassionate, I always say you're playing the long game. You're not, I mean, yeah, I know, I get it. You're trying to cue this run, this time, this class, but you want to be able to cue in three months Mm -hmm. also. You don't want to just like sacrifice everything for like this one time. And so when we play the long game, I think it makes it us easier to be more compassionate and more aware of what we're doing and the signals we're sending back to the dog, the signals they're trying to give us that we're not listening. How can we be more compassionate or more responsive? And so I guess that, I mean, we're coming back to that original question is like, how do you teach people to see like, because two people will look at the same um, behavior and see different things. Absolutely. So yep. how do you open, how do you open our eyes to like learning that better and being more compassionate and then knowing what to do with that information? So one of the things that I've noticed that I've been try- playing around with in my classes is I make my students, when a mistake happens, I don't stop them immediately unless, you know, the, you know, I try and let things play out. And then when they finish their run, I'll say, okay why didn't you feed there or why, you know, what happened there? And I let them try. It depends on the level of the student. Let me just start there with my beginner students. When they mess up, first off, the humans keep wanting to run on. They get so focused on the sequence. (laughs) I'm like, your dog's in the far left corner. Did you even know your dog wasn't following you? (laughs) Um, And they're the first that when their dog doesn't make a jump. And then, so here, my students are going to be like, oh, she says this all the time. (laughs) <laughs> when your dog struggles with an obstacle in class and then they finally complete it correctly, what should you do? And everyone will go, give your dog a cookie. <laughs> and that's the thing. We don't pay enough attention to the good. And this is going to be the, you know, people are going to be like, cheesy positive reinforcement trainer here. But I'm a crossover trainer. I started off with prongs. I used e-collars. I, I hired the best dog trainer, you know, 15 years ago to come and teach me how to correct my dog at the you know right time and blah 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 and then i was my eyes were open to positive reinforcement training which not only made me feel a heck of a lot better but it really does boil down to really only pay the dog for when they are correct and they execute things correctly cuz guess what dogs don't want to be wrong right no, they, they don't, really don't they don't they don't sit there and they go like oh, this let me try this let me try this right well they do when they really want the cookie and they're trying to be right but they right, don't trying to, yeah they don't specifically try to be wrong. They try to figure out what's right. And that to me is what I try to bake into my students' heads. And so I, you will frequently hear me say this, a handler will miscue something and the dog will mess up and they go, they go to go back and fix it. And this is in training. And I will say, give your dog a spirit cookie. They didn't do wrong. Right. Your dog did exactly what you said. If you didn't close your shoulder and they carried out to the tunnel and you're trying to get them into the over this jump to the right and not the left, that was your fault. So feed your dog. And everyone's like, but I'm feeding my dog for not doing the correct thing. Your dog did the correct thing that you told them. And that I think is where we humans cloud judgment. Somebody will be working on their start line stay and their dog will stay and they'll go back and they'll say, good dog. Okay. Well, good dog is good for you. 
but you have you have two right. ways to reinforce that dog. You can go back and give it a cookie, or you can then release it over the jump because the release is a reward. Is the reward correct? Right. And so all these people set up their dogs, and then they they don't reinforce the very thing they're trying to fix. Right. And then so the other thing I want so it's really a complicated issue with us. So your question about how would you help somebody learn and see this? There's two ways. One, video everything. Video your training and video your trialing and compare. And then that's going to give you the the concrete, that's the collection of data, right? The other thing is then start to understand the theory. And I cannot stress this enough. It's an hour read. Please go buy Turek Rugas's Calming Signals. It's a wonderful book. It, it's not going to, you're going to be like, Kara, this doesn't apply to agility. It just talks <laughs> about dogs talking to dogs. Yes. Dogs speak dog right? You don't go to Japan and then just expect everybody to understand you. You try and learn some of the language so that you can understand. Dogs speak dog, so we owe it to them to understand some dog behavior. Yes, they're going to learn our behavior. They learn that a smile, they don't smile. They learn that a smile softens our gaze and that means we're happy. They learn that from us. They learn lots of things from us. They become resilient dealing with us. We owe it to our dogs to learn some of their behaviors. Guess what? Slowing down, yawning, averting eyes, softening gaze, sniffing. These are not our dogs being assholes. These are our dogs saying, I need help. And that to me, when you take that understanding and piece it together with your videos, you will have a greater understanding of what your dog is telling you in the ring. Because we spend so much, this is a handler driven sport right? Unlike scent work or nose work, that is a dog driven sport. We have to watch our dog's body language. Did they take possession? Did they head snap? Are they in the odor cone? We are watching our dogs and we are waiting for them to tell us where source is. In agility, mm -mm, we are directing. If you watched more and directed, you would have a much better journey. Yeah. I will climb off my soapbox now. (laughs) No, no. It's a good soapbox. Um, it makes me think, though, of like the handler's part in that, because I don't want everybody listening to also feel guilty. <laughs> no, please. No. And that's but we naturally will. I do. I know. You said I, know I know. And you are, too. I am, too. Like, we you don't know like, what oh you don't God, know. I don't you know. You don't know what you don't know. You can't. And this is what I love when you say bounce forward. Yes. Don't don't sit there and and oh, if I trust me, every day goes by, I get a little tear in my eye. I'm not joking. Ask my husband. For, I had this amazing dog and I didn't know until yeah. much later in her life. Yeah. I, I can only enjoy every moment going forward. So do not regret, do not feel guilty. We're just yeah. silly. We're terrible humans, right? Like just yeah. accept it. Well, for what the it other is. thing I think is coming up for me in listening to you describe it is there's so many moments where we are defining success in our minds but not even on paper. Like we're not, it's not, we're not even going so far as to write down a process goal or an energetic goal. Even we're just like, even when you're talking, cause when you were talking about the sequences in class and the person stops, cause they got it wrong. And you're saying the dog doesn't know they got it wrong. And the handler is like, yeah, but I did it wrong because we too have been conditioned in our lives to do things right. We're conditioned that a cue is the only, like if your friend walks by and says, how's it going today? Oh my God, she's asking if I cued. Mm-hmm. Maybe she's not. Maybe she just wants to know if you're having a good day, you know? But like, we're so conditioned that the achievement is what we are after, whether it's getting the sequence correct, getting the cue, the whatever. And so now we drag our dogs into this uh, mindset, I guess, or this construct where r- being right is the only option. And I think that really, well, it de- for me, I know that it curtails like confidence, right? You're just, you're not building anybody up. You're tearing yourself down or you're tearing your dog down potentially. And, and yeah, from a guilt perspective, I wish I could go back and redo everything I ever did with Moxie, you know? Um, and, but she'll make me better. It's good. It's fine. Um, but I think that, yeah, we, then, then we listen to something like this and we're like, oh my God, I have to do everything differently. And I don't think it's about that. I just think it's about like building this awareness and really having the intention of having this really great connection and wanting it to be better. And like you're saying, when you know better, 
you do better. Even if it's like one little change that you make and really trying to understand their behavior and really watching the video, not for the line that you did, but like, what was her face at the start line after you kissed her? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what are, what are all those little micro things, you know, that we're, that we're picking up on that our dogs are like, I'm giving you the answer. Like watch. I can't stress how important that awareness concept is. And just, I'm essentially giving you a different lens. I just want to provide you right. a different lens to yes. observe things in. And again, this podcast might not relate to anybody. Their dog is hard. They get it. It's fine. But as a species, and I say this to just my general pet training clients, we're punitive. We're corrective. We're, we critique. And that's our nature, right? We do that to each other. I mean, that's Correct. about dogs. That's Correct. just how humans are. Yeah. And dogs are actually masters of avoiding conflict. They yes. give hundreds of signals before they break out into a fight. When a fight happens, there was a lot of different signals before that happened. And I, I, but we are not aware of them, right? We don't speak dog. We speak to dogs. We speak at dogs. And it's yeah. time for us to start learning a little bit more about them and what they're trying to tell us. And I can tell you now from I have my start line, you know, my my crate to gate ritual. And part of that ritual is testing the waters of where my dog's mindset is before. So let's the go there. Right. Okay. Because so one of the conversations that we had was, you know, the crate, you know, I talk about rituals. I, you know, my listeners know that I'm very passionate about this particular soapbox. Um, I think it's important because it grounds us as handlers, dogs like the predictability, but I think that you add extra layers to this and mm -hmm. specifically the focus of like crate to gate portion of it. You know, mine starts with breakfast or like shopping the day before or whatever, but yeah, go there, get into that. Yeah. So I've had to work very hard. It took me five years, five years to figure out with Debbie, my novice dog who is wonderful why she got so morose when we would go through the gate into the ring. And I was feeding her. Everybody says, feed your dog, get their attention, ask for some tricks. If you want a high dog, ask for moving tricks. Don't ask for sits and downs, get like spins and <laughs> yep. jumps and yep. whatever's right. So I would do all that. I, you know, I'd try and get her to tug. Woo. We have so much fun. And I feed her, feed her, feed her. And then I go in the ring and she's like, food stop. Mom's weird. Blech. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now, yeah. And what I'll, do we do as handlers? As handlers, we freak out. Right. That's a trigger. That becomes a trick. Well, I'm just tying that back for. Oh, I, my I obsessed and that, triggered over it for yeah, years. Yeah, exactly. Because so it becomes a trigger. So for, as soon as you see the, like their head drop or that first sign, you know your shoulders drop. You're like, oh my god, not this again. Oh no. Mm -hmm. Oh no. Oh no. Which just adds right into it. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. So. <laughs> long story short, I finally, I put this together and was like, okay, why don't I try not feeding her? Because as I went through dog training school, I learned, you know, about chains and dogs learn, take all these behaviors and think of behaviors each as a link in a chain. And so one behavior is just me opening the crate door, Debbie coming out. We have a whole stretching routine. That's a link. And you can even break those down into five links. Right. And then we get our leash on and I tell her little things and I scratch her little butt. I mean, I could go on. There's, there's a million pieces to my chain that imagine this metal chain leading from my crate all the way down to, to the gate. And I say down, cause I'm mostly trial to place that has stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that all has pieces. And I was chopping that chain in half and breaking it. The second I went through that gate, there was such a clear line that Debbie was like, it just was you. So I stopped the reward right? Because she was getting like, oh, if I just do tricks, I get, I was breaking the chain into links instead of one solid piece. And so I created a solid piece to get Debbie from her crate to the gate, to the start line. We run the course. And after we run the course, we run upstairs and we get our cookies and we get our cookies specifically. She gets beef heart in a hot lap where I walk around and I cool her down, walk around, mm, beef heart, mm -hmm. beef heart, beef heart. She loves beef heart, but what does she really want? That duck foot. She only gets a duck foot when she goes into her crate. She can't go into her crate until we've cooled down, right? Even the beef heart is a, is a link in this chain. And so once I mastered that, and it took a little while, 
I got it. So then I was like, okay, I need to apply this to my other dogs. So Walter, I was feeding him because he would just bark. He would demand bark at me while we're waiting. Nobody wants to hear uh, bark of the dog. Speaking of bark. Right. <laughs> you, Wendy. Right on uh, cue. <laughs> good girl. So anyways, I stopped it with him, but he needed to do tricks and I needed to have fun. So we created a chain where he goes high five, paw, chin. And he rests his chin <laughs> on my leg. And I okay. ask it at random times. He has no idea when I'm going to ask for it. And so that became our thing. Phoenix, I needed to get her jazzed up. I'm still working on her. I, I go spicy bean on her and I get, she likes to be pinched. She loves it, right? Hold on two seconds. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how they're all so different. Yes, and then now that I've studied, so- I created these chains. Everybody has to kind of look at their, I'm happy to give advice, but everybody has to look at their things differently. When the, or I realized that Debbie, all of my dogs have custom made collars that are Martin Gale clips. So mm -hmm. nothing comes over their head because right. I, I don't really have many fingernails, but I notice sometimes when I take their regular walking collars off, my fingernails will hit the back of their ears and I can't feel good. There's all these things oh, that they, yeah. they don't like over their head, longer coated dogs, obviously the pulling so I figured out all these things, but then I also started to realize when you start studying calming signals and ring stress, some of it, you don't necessarily want to get rid of. I'm going to change lanes a little bit here. Instead of talking about the crate to gate, I just want to talk about once you get inside the gate, I used to, Phoenix, I get her all spiced up. And then sometimes she would shake before a run, shake off, do a shake off. It's like, oh, yep. she's stressed, right? We all know that's a sign of stress. That's a release. It's a release. It's yeah. a release. I let her, I set her further back so that I can allow the space yes. for her. So she doesn't have to drop that bar or she will not. She will hurl her body over to avoid dropping that bar. But that's another piece to my crate to gate routine. Once I get through that gate, I have to set her further back. Not because she's some long-legged, big strided dog. She needs shake off space. Yeah. Right. And it's just picking up on those. It's minutia. But it all. What adds was up. the? I know it's hard for you to like teach us, you know, in like a, a few minutes how to do all this. But like with your first dog that you said took five minutes, first of all, or five years. First of all, thank you for admitting that something took that long, because so often everybody wants the quick thing. They want to know that like, oh, I can change these three things in my. I mean, it'll be you know double Q nineteen in no time, and sometimes that's not true. No. Um, so how did you? Because I, I think that there's a balance, honestly, because there's a balance between what the handler needs to get to the ring so that we're not stressed out or we're calm or we're giving our own, whether it's breathing or whatever it is what we need to do. And then what the dog needs and how different dogs need different things. So like, what was there an, an aha moment with that dog that you were like, oh, I finally got the information or I finally read the book or saw the thing or saw the video that made me think like, she doesn't want me to be a Pez dispenser and then walk in the rain. Like, was there, was there a moment or how did you, no, how did so you figure it, was it out? Data collection. Okay. I would try different things. You know, sometimes I would do the food later or I do the food earlier or I just move things around and it was collecting that data and seeing what worked. And then it was my slow but steady understanding of behavior and really watching her instead of, you know, would she come off the line fast if I fed her later, you know, we came down and I didn't give her food until we got right to the gate or if I didn't feed her at all, you know, I took all these, I took spaghetti and threw it against the wall and collected okay. data and figured out what worked. That and was how like, often did you try, did, did you have any science around like, because I, I don't like people to try something once and then it right. not work. So and that's my thing. They I, give up on it. Right. So I would try, I would say for about a month um, and I try all every weekend. So that was, and this is during her agility grand champion. So I was trialing six classes a day. So okay. I had a lot of right. Abilities. So 24 tries. Right. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you, I remember when I thought I had reached it, I was in Clifton, New Jersey, middle of July. It was ungodly hot. <laughs> and I, I thought that if I could get Debbie to tug before each run, she would be happy. And it sort of worked that I got her. To, so this ungodly hot, I didn't think this dog would want to get all hot and sweaty before each run. She did. So I thought that worked a couple of weeks later, she wouldn't tug. 
I did hmm. the same exact thing as Jersey, but I couldn't get her to tug. And so back at the drawing board, right? So, okay. And this is kind of a silly aha moment, but this no, is, it all links this is accidental. I had a friend, she was leash running and we were in time to beat. And I think I was pretty close to my agility grand. This was bold of her to do very bold. <laughs> Debbie, who everybody knows is very stoic and serious. They, she's just, we call her stick in the mud for a boxer. She's just, <laughs> she just looks at you. And unless you give her treats, she wants nothing to do with you. She's friendly, but neutral. Okay. So she's sitting on the start line and my friend who's a leash runner walks by. I do not recommend this. She blows in her butt. And Debbie flips yeah, around. I don't recommend at, that either. No, I don't recommend this, but I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> flips around and looks at her and Debbie gives her literally the death stare. Like if I were an aggressive dog, I would bite you right now. So then I'm like, what are you doing? I lead out. She won't come off the line. This dog always comes off the line. So oh. I'm like, my friend. I have a leash runner to kill. <laughs> right. And then when I got her off the line, I kid you not, I had the best, fastest run of my life. And that was a little, but you know thing. what that reminds me of that reminds me of what you said. Noreen would um, ask you what sound a duck makes yeah. that feels like the dog equivalent to distraction and to stress and to getting your frontal cortex text back in the game. Like that's what that sounds like to me. Well, that was my, if you honestly ask what my aha moment, and I don't, I'm sorry, this isn't very helpful to others because I can't say, <laughs> right. have your friend blow on your dog's butt. In the, <laughs> no, but please don't. But what I did, I think that's what, what it but did. But what did you learn me, out of it? Yeah. So she, she loves, hates her butt getting blown on. And I go up to her and I, if I pretend to go blow on her butt before each run, she yeah. will then jump into my arms and pounce on me. And I say, oh, you chose violence today. And we have this thing that when Debbie does that, I know like today, last, this Saturday, when I had the tearful, joyful standard run that we were first place and I, this dog's almost 10 and I just was yeah. crying with joy because it was so amazing. I was play blow, blowing on her butt. She was jumping in my arms. Like, <laughs> well, that... and what no one can see, no one could see your, we're doing this on zoom and no one can see like your whole face changed in telling the story and in the joy and in the energy of telling the story. And I think it's part like, yay, I found the key. And yes, it was a funny story. And like how much joy it brings you now to know that you're doing something with her for her that she likes, that she has bought into yeah. that also equates to like, yeah, we're going to go play this game and we're going to have fun doing it. Um, because this is all in alignment now, well, like I our think... energies are in alignment. To be helpful to people, if anybody listens to Sarah Streming, she's a wonderful trainer and she has a podcast as well, Cogdog Radio. She says, she talks about start line behavior, start button behavior. And Ooh. that I stumbled upon Debbie's start button behavior. And what this means is this is a behavior. This is a cue that we ask of our dog. So I pretend to blow on her butt. There's times where she doesn't react. That's when I know the run's going to be pretty rudimentary and nothing special. Okay. But, um, and it's like with Phoenix, if I pinch and punch her and get her all excited and grab her feeties and she doesn't do anything, that run's going to be pretty meh. But if I cue, those are cues, right? I'm just, I'm asking for them to be, to, to react a certain way. I've, I'm giving a verbal cue or a pinchy well, touchy. You're, you're also head. testing where they are. It's, it's your way to test where they're I'm testing their mindset. <laughs> right. Well, and where their energy is. Yeah. And so those things, I figured out what their start button behaviors are. And so with Wendy, I'm very much in that. And I feel pretty confident um, her start button behavior is this collar grab. I've always made collar grabs hmm. because I, to my puppy own my puppy training clients, I always say to them, grab the, the collar like you would that they're going to get hit by a car and then pay. Oh, them heavily OK. That, right. That's just a puppy yep. collar, collar grab. Because yeah. We don't want our puppy, we grab the collar and they go, ew, and they back out and run away. Right, for sure. I don't yeah. expect them to like it, but I expect them to have a good association, just like getting their nails done, all those things that we discussed earlier. I want them to have a positive association. So I've always played with that with Wendy and she's always seemed to enjoy it. She gets kind of mouthy and argh, gets her riled up. So I do a collar grab right before our runs and I kind of tossle her around. And that's my start button behavior with her. So each one of my dogs with Walter, it's the, will he put his chin on my knee? Sometimes he'll miss my knee intentionally. And that's when I know he's not ready to go. So it's the start button behavior where I'm cueing and asking my dog, are you ready to go? And based on their response, that can tell me 
pretty much to a really high reliability how that run's going to go. And what if they're not? What if they're not ready to go? Because I, I can hear some of my clients going, oh my God, if my dog said no, I would freak out. <laughs> so you have and to that make, would make them nervous, right? right? You have to make a choice. I've gone in the ring and when they've said no, sometimes I've actually set them up and they won't set, like something's off. I will walk off. I've walked off. I've done that. Why would I put my dog in a situation when they clearly told me I can't do this? Other times I've tried that. to, I've, I've tried to do the run and I still do this to this day. Um, uh, particularly with Wendy, I still do it with Phoenix. I can feel them slowing. Not really. Oh, thank you. I put my hand up. Thank you. And I walk off. Yep. Say, you didn't want to play today. That's okay. And then we walk off an hour right. later. They could be fine. This is very in the moment. And that's what stinks about agility. Here's, here's the great news. We train really hard for these moments and they can be super fun. And that's what we should always bring to the table. But sometimes in that exact moment, your dog could have a headache. Your dog could have gas. Yeah. Your dog could have had to poop and they didn't get to. And they go in the ring and they don't feel 100%. They might not be able to do it. And that's what stinks because you've paid your money to get that run. But in that moment, in that 30 seconds, they just couldn't do it. And we owe it to them to not push that because then you're just going to build a negative, bad association where agility feels icky. Right. 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 And so that's something I have walked off more than I would ever feel comfortable, but it, I believe long game it's bought me cues. I mean, Phoenix is almost at Mach six. I put that dog away for two years because I couldn't figure wow. out her stress. Wow. He would walk. She would refuse. I only brought her out in the middle of the pandemic. Debbie had shown some, some shoulder limping. And I was like, oh, Debbie's, Debbie's gone. And the trial hadn't closed yet. And I asked the secretary, I said, hey, it's not closed. Can I switch dogs? She said, sure. So we brought Phoenix in. Phoenix double queued. Because I- <laughs> she, After two years. After two <laughs> years of not, she didn't queue for like seven or eight months. And it was all, it was awful. I just, I put her away. It was over two years. I brought her back out in, it was August of 2020. And from there on out, she has now nearly gotten six mocks in three years. So, wow. and that's just because I put her away. I didn't put her in that situation anymore because I wasn't walking off courses. I wasn't treating her well. I didn't understand it. I was begging her to continue to run. I was going, beans. I was yelling at her, like, let's go, you know, or and she was like, Ugh. right. I tried all of that. Yeah. It didn't work. It didn't work. I did nose work, which built her confidence which fixed our communication because now my dog had to tell me that they found source, not me telling my dog to take a jump. My dog had to tell me that they found source. So that, I, and I talk about that in one of my episodes, the value of scent work because it is a dog driven as opposed to- Yeah, you have to, to be a listener. Your... You have to become a listener, not a talker. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, and a studier, good. a studier, right? And right. Also, and this isn't easy for a lot of people, and this is where I think I really connected with Noreen in her creativity in solutions. I know you asked yes. me, like, well, how'd you how'd you do that? Well, it took a friend blowing on her butt for me to figure that one out. <laughs> That's pretty it, creative. <laughs> right. It took, you know, Noreen's the one that came up with, and I want to talk really quickly about, we always try and proof an obstacle versus- Yes, talk about that. Versus stress an obstacle out more so our dog can handle it more stress. So right. everybody will say, my dog, you can't replicate trial stress. You, it's just impossible. Correct. Correct. The only way you can replicate trial stress is if you go in to a standard run and your dog thinks that you want a cue and then you in the instant change your mind that you're not going to cue and it's going to be a training run. Like that. that's as close as you can get. And even that's still a little, they can smell right. your mindset change. <laughs> yes. So since we can't replicate trial stress, we absolutely can replicate stress, right? So proofing is when we take a dog and create distractions and ask the dog to ignore the distractions. Stressing a dog out and making them see distractions is telling them to acknowledge the distractions and work around them. So this is a very important difference. Say we have a weave pole issue and we put our dog in the weave poles and we take toys and we throw them around or we take their favorite, their favorite ball and we bounce it beside them. That's proofing. That's asking the dog to ignore their favorite thing or a toy or an instructor. 
But when we take, say your dog doesn't like water. I know yours do. So let's say bubble wrap <laughs> or paper, fine. right? Let's yeah. take something that our dog, tinfoil, right? And we put it underneath the entrance to the weave poles and we ask our dogs to get in. We are now telling our dogs, we just made those weave poles even more icky, yucky, right? And now we're asking them to weave and we're going to pay so heavily when they do that. If we put bubble wrap and for my dogs, it's water. If I take a wet towel and put it at the opening or in the middle or towards the end and I make them so they have to touch it. First, I start off where they can go around it. Now they're getting some crazy entrances. Mm -hmm. Good for them. But then I make it so that they must touch this towel or bubble wrap and they go in and they get it. When they get to a trial, they're like, I don't see the bubble. I don't see the, I can do these. There's no stress around this obstacle now. And that is a difference. When you stress an obstacle out, Noreen has this really great water bottle wall. And I know this is really big in Mondio and a lot of other sports. It's just strings on a PVC frame with a whole bunch of water ball bottles with empty holes water bottles. Empty, empty water bottles. Yeah. Yes, empty. Very important. <laughs> just checking. <laughs> so they make that like clunk, 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 that like yep. no. and they touch the dog and they walk through them and you can take, you can remove so they only have to walk by two or three of them or they can walk by 20 of them. We were doing that with dogs too. We were having them pass through the water bottle wall and they were like, ugh, and go to the weaves. Suddenly you took a more stressful obstacle, water bottle wall, and then presented it with a much now easier obstacle. The the weave poles Mm -hmm. alone, if you did jump weave, the weaves were more stressful. But when you do water bottle weave, the water bottle wall is more stressful than the weave poles. The weave poles then become easier. Yeah. And so stressing our dogs in training will translate to making when we have different stress, although it's still stress in trials, Mm -hmm. it makes it easier. Well, and one thing, and I've shared this with my listeners before is, is uh, something that I credit Rachel Sanders for saying to me at a seminar, which is dogs have to learn stress because it is not in their nature to work through stress. When the dog is presented with something stressful, it is fight or flight. Like, and so would, if the weave pulls are stressful, are they going to avoid them? Are they get, like, what are they going to do to show them to get themselves out of this? Because they don't understand the concept of like, this is temporary. Just do the weave pulls. It'll be over in a flash. Like, what's the big deal? Like they don't, that is not how their mind works. They mm-hmm. don't understand that this whole run will be over in 40 seconds and they'll be back in their crate. They just, they know how they feel right now because everything is so in the present moment. Mm-hmm. They can't imagine it going away or feeling any differently. So they, all of that is learned. Like we don't, we don't stop and think about how much they have to learn that they have to learn and some dogs, yes, are more resilient than others. Some dogs, yes. you know, you can correct them and they're like, oh, great. Tell me more. Other dogs, you correct them. They're like, oh my God, you hate me. I'm going to, you know, I can't do this anymore. And they, you know, being very dramatic, obviously, but like every, they react differently. So resilience is something I think, like, I would just use that word to describe what you're talking about, but learning to cope and learning to perform in the face of stress is not natural. That is right. not a natural And it's not natural thing. for us. And it's not a way that we think to train. So if you have somebody that has a dog walk issue or weave pole issue, we think if we just put steak at the More. end of it or make them, make them weave for dinner, right? That right. because we're doing it a hundred times, right? Because we're upping our level of, of reinforcement or our value of reinforcement that we're making it better for them, but, but we're not. We need to actually stress that obstacle out so that when they get to the situation where they find it stressful, it is less so because it is it is in his natural state that the dog can easily do. And so right. that I think is a key to really helping your dog deal with stress. We don't use, and you you, you said this perfectly in um, I believe our last podcast or one of your podcasts, we go into training each week and we just whatever the instructor sets up, we just do it. Yep. Whatever. Yep. We do. We yep. don't say, Hey, I brought this newspaper. Can I just slide this under the weave poles really quickly? I won't take any extra time. In fact, you can knock off three obstacles. Cause I just want to focus on this. Right. We need to advocate more for our dogs. We need to advocate more for our training and we need to use our training more valuably and more, more um, mindfully, I would say, 
to yeah. get I call it deliberate these, training. Deliberate. That's yeah. a great word. Right. We yeah. need to have more deliberate training sessions. And people always say, I'll just drill it. I've trained it. My dog can weave from across the room. And really, can your dog weave, you know, from across the room with a water, you know, a wet rag underneath? Right. right? And can well, I, and I, I mean, recently at my specialty, the feet were all different of the um, yeah. weave poles and neither of my dogs. I, Trip eventually got it, but you could see him. I always laugh because he has a really wide uh, white blaze. And when he's thinking though, it squunches together. It's really funny. And so his little white blaze was tiny and he was, you could see him like doing calculus to try to figure out how, out yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And finally he got it. And he was like, oh, interesting because my dogs look at the feet apparently. Mm -hmm. Right. And what I, how I say it is we teach them and then they show us what they learned. Yep. You know, I have taught them weave poles. Trip has very reliable weave poles, but what he showed me, he learned is that feet matter, <laughs> you know, that yep. he's following the feet and where the feet of those are in this in and out. Okay. So I think that that's interesting that we do at least as much listening as we do talking. Um, the other thing I want you to talk through is as we're going through this and we're trying to teach our dogs and we're trying to find ways to make them more resilient. Um, but we're, you know, we're not getting it. We're not getting it. Like, how do you stave off the like depression that comes, right? The, the bummers, the like, oh my God, this isn't working that, that thing, you know, how do you get your students to be like, trust the process or, you know, I, I don't know. What do you say? What do you, how do you get them through that? Well, there's a couple different ways. You can either have a bottle of wine and send your students a hundred <laughs> videos of you failing. Um, yeah. at, I, you know, I joke, but that is actually the truth. Or I, I do have, I do spend a lot of my weekends. I had a lovely conversation over messenger with one of my students. You know, they, they're, they're feeling it. And, and we all get this. Yeah. We all feel that we're not the norm. And I'm going to tell not you the not the norm and we're not good enough or we're failing our dogs at some right. point. And not enough people talk about this. We all have our failures. First off, stop comparing your journey to anybody else's. 100%. Secondly, somebody has either gone through this or gone through it worse and they're, you, you can commiserate together. But what I'd like to say is rather than focus on the failure, because it's usually one or two things, or it is just stress, which is overarching, but your training is really good. Focus on the good and then focus on if you're not a creative person, get with a creative person, find a person like yourself to help with mindset that can get you the kind of outside of your yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah. I yeah. would brainstorm be, it, like right. literally brainstorm. It. I wouldn't be where I am without others. And I find it frustrating. I'm an instructor here that has access to creative, creative solutions and I, I provide a lot to my students and they don't use all of it. And that's okay. I try and provide them a hundred percent. If they take away 30%, I know I'm making their journey better. So yeah. you have the, as a, as an exhibitor, as a, um, you know, a student, you have the choice to pick what works for you and what you want to try, but you have to, my biggest piece of advice is you have to do something different than what you're doing. Cause if what you're doing isn't working, stop. I'm so sick of people doing the same thing every single weekend. And like they post the one video that their dog got the weaves and then you're like, yeah, they did it. I'm like, but you didn't do anything differently to get there. Just in that situation where those weaves were, how you could cue them, your dog's stress level for that reason, they could do it. But long-term you're not making anything better. So you're going to struggle next weekend. I'm, you're going to feel sad and I'm going to feel sad for you. So make changes. It's, you, you do have to pick your battles. I know we talked about, you know, criteria and sometimes you do have to pick your battles. This is very true. If you have a contact issue, but it only erupts every 15 to 30 runs, then maybe right. that's not your focus. But if you have a stress issue that, that your start line is crap, which is contagious for the rest of your run, then that should probably be your focus. You yeah. really have to take your whole journey and break apart what is making you the most unhappy and your dog. Because the number one reason we all do this is for fun. And if you're not having fun, you need to make changes. Like point blank. Yeah. And the thing I would add to that is when you make these changes, write them down. 
you know, treat yes. them like a little experiment so that you know what you did. Collect you your data to, and analyze it. Yeah. You don't have to be like super, super anal about it. Make five words, five words of things, things you did differently. Just, and if you want to write a page, please, by all means, write a page. But I, I always try to remove the pressure so that like people don't have to feel like they have to write a whole page, but like track it because how else are you going to know that it worked? Right. Like right. And I, I, I thought I'm... I had my weave solved at one point and I was like, oh my God, we did it. We did it for a whole weekend. It was amazing. It was the best week of my life. You know, and then the next, then I went to a new place and it was like starting over. Yeah. And so, but you write it down. What did I do? What, you know, cause I found one of my secrets kind of by accident too. Again, a friend made a suggestion we were taking advantage of a match and it ended up being something I was able to stick with and incorporate, you know, going forward. So yeah, brainstorm, write it down, try different things, um, involve your coaches, get help from somebody else. Well, that's the other thing I want to say just really quickly. Cause then I do, I know we could talk forever, but I do have to go. Cause I have to go train a puppy, <laughs> but <laughs> I would say, look at your source we have a million mouths going after each run and, and everybody yeah. wants to help you. This is not, I believe everybody genuinely is very kind and helpful. We all know the timing and don't be the unsolicited advice and all that stuff, but know your source. I think there's a lot of amazing trainers out there that can get these dogs around these technical, difficult courses that don't know behavior. And I know there's yeah. a lot of trainers that understand behavior that can't get a dog around a course and vice versa. And there's everything in the middle and there's everything in between I am not the right trainer for a lot of people. I can help other people, but really understand where that person you're getting that information has come from. Have they experienced it? And that's where I finally started to listen to Noreen. I didn't understand that she had gone through these struggles because you see her running her dogs now and you're like, wow, she's got some great distance. These are really well-trained dogs. How could she have possibly had an issue? She wasn't relatable to me. And then uh, only because right. I, I was newer to the sport. Other people yeah. had struggles that she yeah. went through only because I started listening to all of her stories and she had three dogs with three weave Polish. I was like, oh, you are yeah. a very valuable source. Yeah. And I would listen to somebody else and they, I've never had that experience. So I, I don't Yeah. Know. I mean, we have to apply some, our own cognitive thinking to this, right? Yeah. We know our dogs and the only, the last thing I'd love for you to parse, I know you have to go, but last thing is, you know, we humanize our dogs so much it that the so other nice. way I can see this pendulum swinging is someone is now so everything is stress. Oh my God, my dog is stress. Oh my God, my dog hates it here. My dog hates this. They hate that. I mean, we do over humanize them mm -hmm. um, and not let, let them be dogs come at it from a dog perspective. We come at their stress from a human perspective and I get it. We don't know how to relate and we're trying very hard to relate, mm -hmm. but I also don't want everybody to be like, oh, it's just stress or, oh, it's just this is, you know, so how do you figure that out? Or what do you say to that? I know this sounds kind of silly, but I would just giggle, right? Like <laughs> it, it just, just take the pressure off. If your dog is stuck, just giggle. Like it's not a, so what that they wouldn't get on the table for the past four runs that you've had, you know, just, okay, we'll work through it. Let's come up with a plan. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I always, I always want to ask like, is it a real problem? Like, right. you know, is it a, is it a real thing or is it situational? Is it, you know, something else like really? And that's where, if you don't write down the other things, you don't know. I, I just don't want people to use their dogs as an excuse. No, no, <laughs> no. It's, and I don't want to also be like, it's you, but it's you. Guess what? It's you. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. even if your dog has stress, it's you because you haven't alleviated it for them. It's your job to alleviate it for them. That's your, you signed that entry form. You signed up for that class. You put them in that trial. If they're stressing out, that's on you. I'm not saying you caused it, but no. I no. hope that everybody can find ways and, you know, again, reach out to me. I'm open to, to working through th some things. I'm going to try and open up a Facebook group and get organized. Cause I talked to Julie about how I need to get my <laughs> mindset organizing around this. But the point is, um, you know, I had Debbie after I had my teary standard run and it was amazing. And I, I went into jumpers. I was cocky. I was like, yo, I got this. I got this right. <laughs> he passed behind me. I was like a curved, perfect line. It was simple. It was a jump, triple jump tunnel, like straight, right? Somehow, some way, I don't know. I must have scratched my forehead and caused a blind. She crossed behind me. And I was like, what? The I just had to laugh. 
I, I yeah. wanted to cry and I just giggled and she got, she was like, this obstacle. She started taking all the, and I was like, you goofball, let's go. Like, yeah. I wanted to cry in that moment. Yeah. But you, but it's you, not world peace. No. It's not world peace. No. And you still got out there and had fun. But I, 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 I do want to end on, think about your pre-trial and pro post-trial routines too. There's a lot to be said for decompression. I've really incorporated that into, if we've got a dog, Wendy, who's stressing, I'm not going to just take her to this trial. She's going to stress all day. She's going to stress through her runs and then bring her home and be like, go sleep on the couch. Right. I've made it a point. I take her swimming. I go for a run. I throw her a ball. I do something to be like, you did yeah. this trial stuff for me. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to let you sniff. I'm going to let you do whatever. And so I, the right. other day it was really hot. I just brought her to a field and let her sniff around. And it doesn't have to be complex. Yeah. It can be five, 10 minutes. It can be at the right. trial site. It can be at home. I think that has been truly helpful for the stress in my dogs and building resiliency. If I don't let them close that stress gap. Yeah. Um, I always say that the energy has to go somewhere, whether it's yes. us or our dogs, you know, yes. and it will find an outlet if it, if you don't give it one, you know, right. um, and just like we snap at people if we're feeling stressed, it's right. It's going to show up in that It'll, ring. It's going to show up somewhere. Right. Yeah. Cool. All well, right. thank you so much. <laughs> I know much. we could talk so much more. I was like, I'm sorry. We have this could. <laughs> no, we could talk forever. And I just really appreciate it. And in the show notes will be all the places you can hook up with Kara and um, her podcast and some of the other things that we mentioned. So be sure to check the, sh the show notes. But thank you, Kara, so much for your time thank and you, Julie, for, for everything you're you. doing to make uh, you know our lives with our dogs better. So appreciate it. All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Mindset Coaching for Handlers podcast with me, Julie Bacon. I am so grateful for your precious time. Check out my Dogged Planner workbook and journal available on Amazon. Just search for Dogged Planner. I also offer monthly membership that's perfect for ongoing support of your awesome goals. Check out theqcoach.com for details or just stop by and check out all the ways you can work on your mindset. And be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at The Q Coach and let me know how it's going. Finally, please share, subscribe, and leave a review. This helps us podcasters tremendously. Plus, I know I get my best podcast recommendations from friends. Thanks and have a great week with your dogs.